you are, and I'm glad you're here. <laughs> giving, me, you're gi here. giving me permission. <laughs> Thank you. No, it's been great uh, being here with you this morning. Uh, we've been looking forward to this time uh, with you, and um, we really appreciate that time remembering uh, the Lord together. I have a little uh, object here, and I wonder if you can tell me what this is. It's a plumb line. Yes, very good. We have some people that are familiar with construction. That's uh, very good. I was expecting a Capuano to be here to, uh, to, uh, to tell me uh, what it is. But that is a plumb line. It's a construction tool used to help build things straight. Uh, plumb line means perfectly vertical. Um, it's used for aligning. It was also used as a guide and uh, used for centering. It would, uh, it would hang from the center of a structure and, uh, and point uh, right down straight uh, so um, during the building process the, the builders would know exactly where the center of the structure was. Please turn to the book of Amos. The book of Amos. And if you are familiar with the book of Amos, you know that uh, in the days of Amos, things were going very well for the nation of Israel. They had lots of food, they had lots of money, things were very peaceful. But there was a problem that the people had rejected God. They weren't obeying his laws, they had turned to worshiping idols, they became very dishonest and, just, and unjust in their business transactions. The uh, rich oppressed the poor. So the poor got poorer and the rich got richer. It was a very selfish society. And God warned them about rejecting him and, be, and becoming bad. And he told them, um, if they do not change, that something very horrible is going to happen. That they will lose their homes, they will lose their possessions. And unless they repent and turn back to obedience to God, um, something very bad was going to happen. So God came to Amos in a vision. And in chapter 7 of Amos, reading just uh, verses 7 and 8, it says there, This is what he showed me. Behold, the Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line. When with, or sorry, built with a plumb line with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, behold, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. So God was telling Israel through this vision, you know, things are so crooked in Israel, I'm going to do something just to show you how crooked you really are. You know, we live in a world where um, no one is perfect. No one is perfect, but yet at the same time, no one is wrong. That's kind of really the world we live in, isn't it? And that's the way that it was in uh, that time with Israel. A little boy came to his mother saying, Mommy, I'm as tall as Goliath. And his mother, kind of very surprised, say, Why do you say that? He said, You know, I'm as tall as Goliath. I'm, I'm, nine, I'm nine feet high. And she said, Well, rather, supply, rather surprised, Well, why would you say that? And he said, well, I made myself a little ruler of my own and measured myself with it, and I'm nine feet tall. And, you know, and that's what we do, don't we, in our sin. Um, we create our own rules, and we create our own standards, but it's not reality, is it? It's not reality at all, and it is definitely not truth. In Amos chapter 8, verse 11, the Lord says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, nor of thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from north to east, and they shall run to and fro to seek the, the word of the Lord, and they shall not find it. And we can relate to this passage of scripture today in our society. You know, we're living in a starving land. Our country is starving. Our society is starving. The Bible and God are rejected, and they are seen as absolute foolishness. How does our world set a standard? How does it know what the standard is? How does it determine 
what is right and what is wrong? Well, the Apostle Paul, he answers these questions very well, very well in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. How, and he points out how the Corinthians determined their standard. He says, but when they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are without understanding. So the way they determined things was by comparing themselves with each other. And uh, that method of measuring is absolute foolishness, isn't it? What are you using as a tool to know that your life is straight? And what you believe you know is straight? How do you know what you say is right? How do you know what you do is perfect and what you think is upright? You know, we're bombarded with, uh, with information and opinions. We hold instant information and multiple fo points of view on any topic literally in our hand with our cell phones today. And we can gather information from somebody within seconds from somebody on the other side of the world. You know, politicians and celebrities and sports stars, famous musicians, authors, teachers, scientists, you know, in many cases, these are the types of people that are setting the standards for today. And, you know, social media has become a soapbox for any wind of thought. Um, that, and people are growing more and more ignorant to what God has to say and turning to what respectable or influential people in their estimation, what they have to say. You know, in a world that is so crooked, where can we see the perfect angle and see what truth is? Are you using the plumb line that God has provided for us today? Because God has set a plumb line in the midst of the world, and it is the Lord Jesus Christ, it is the Holy Scriptures, and it is the Holy Spirit. And we, um, these three show us what is straight and what is not. We have the Holy Spirit, the third person in the Trinity. He is at work currently in the world, in this age of grace, convicting the world of their sin, of its sin and its righteousness and of judgment. And, um, <clears throat> and like the plumb line, he is a guide showing us what is crooked and what is straight using the Holy Scriptures. You see, the Holy Spirit and the Holy Scriptures are inseparable. The two work together. The Scriptures are used to help us know what the Holy Spirit is saying to us, and the Holy Spirit helps us interpret what the Holy Scriptures are saying. The two work together. They, should, they cannot be separated. And the Bible says that reading God's Word is like looking into a mirror. It shows us what we, were, what we are doing wrong. It shows us what we are thinking if it is wrong. Um, in regards to how we act if it is wrong and, if we are say, what, and what we are saying if it is wrong. And the plumb line reminds us of the Lord Jesus Christ. It hangs in the center, doesn't it? It hangs in the center suspended between heaven and earth for everyone to see just as Jesus hung on a cross between heaven and earth at the center point of history for all the world to see. The Lord Jesus came at the center of history, not at the beginning and not at the end, but his coming was central. So a view could him could be seen on both ends, looking forward and also looking back. Two perspectives that all mankind through history need to give account. He came to be the bearer of our sin, the sacrifice um, for our sins and for our wrongdoing. He who is perfect, he was absolutely perfect and he did no wrong. He thought no wrong. He was the perfect example for us to look to. First John chapter 3 verse 5 says, Jesus was revealed to take away sin and in him there is no sin. George Welding in his book entitled The Man of Galilee he examines the character of Christ like the standard of a plumb line. And I thought this was very interesting. He says this regarding the Lord Jesus and his ministry. 
No excitement in the surrounding crowds. No perils. No threatenings. No sorrow or grief. No weariness. Nothing whatever at any time casts the slightest shadow across the clearness of his mind. It seems an impossibility for any untoward accident to cause him mental confusion. And with this thought, study his whole career again. And the remarkable fact will appear that unlike all other men, he is not dependent upon favoring physical conditions for his highest intellectual work. His mind preserves its exquisite balance and moves on as radiant and as clear as the sun in a summer sky. He is, we say, not only the clearest, but he is at all times the most simple teacher of profound truth that ever came among men. Proverbs chapter 3 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord turn away from evil. What type of builder would see something while he's building be crooked and not correct it? What kind of a builder would that be? Well, obviously, he's obviously probably a builder that he just simply maybe just doesn't care with the fact with what he's building is defective. Maybe he's lazy. Um, a builder who really just simply ignores the future consequences of uh, what could possibly happen. We'd say that this is a foolish builder, wouldn't we? A very foolish builder. Would you want to live in a house built by somebody like that? Well, of course not. But why do we not take just as seriously the lives that we are living and building every day? We have only one life to live, only one life to live. And why would we build it foolishly? Why would we not surrender to the master builder? San Francisco's skyscraper, the Millennium Tower, is sinking, and it is on a tilt. Work began in November 2020 to drill down hundreds of feet to stabilize the 58-story Millennium Tower. But engineers suspended the operation to assess why the building had sunk another inch during construction. The tower, which opened in April 2009, had been tilting slightly more than 17 inches at the top at the time that work began, and sinking had slowed. But by mid-August, the building's foundation had sunk another inch since the upgraded work had started, and the tilting had increased five inches. But by 2016, the building sunk 16 inches into the soft soil and landfill of San Francisco's dense financial district. It was also leaning, creating a two-inch tilt at the base and a six-inch lean at the top. Residents sued, sued the developer and designers. A confidential settlement reached in 2020 included $100 million to install 52 concrete 140,000 pound piles to anchor the building to bedrock, 250 feet below ground. And these piles are intended to provide foundational support. So what is the answer for correcting this problem with the Millennium Tower? You know, this is very recent news. Um, uh, considering uh, what are the results going to be, what, what, what is what is the proposal going to be to fix, um, to fix this problem? That, that is yet to be seen. And in some situations, really, when you consider this situation, um, maybe the best thing to really do is to simply tear it, tear it down and rebuild and do it right. But that requires a great cost, doesn't it? It'll cost a lot of money to take something like this down and rebuild it. And for many, in most situations, they refuse this option because it just costs too much. There's just too much of a cost to tear down and to rebuild. Amos chapter 9 and verse 11. 
It says, in that day, I will rebuild the collapsing hut of David. I will seal its gaps, repair its ruins, and restore it to what it was like in days gone by. And as a result, they were conquer those left in Edom and all the nations subject to my rule. The Lord who is about to do this is speaking. Be sure of this, the time is coming, says the Lord, when the plowman will catch up to the reaper and the one who stomps the grapes will overtake the planter. Juice will run down the slopes and it will flow down all the hillsides. And I will bring back my people Israel and they will rebuild the cities lying in rubble and settle down and they will plant vineyards and drink the wine they produce and they will grow orchards and eat the fruit they produced. I will plant them in their land and they will never again be uprooted from the land that I have given them, says the Lord your God. You know, some structures like cathedral ceilings, uh, the plumb line was established and it, and it hung there. It stayed there till the construction was complete. The plumb line was always, it was always looked to, always referred to during construction. And just like Jesus, who came at that central point in our lives, the Word of God, it is our, our daily guide. It is paired with the Holy Spirit leading us in the work. I want to take just a few minutes for the remainder of the time that we have, and I want us to take a plumb line, and I want us to hang it. Just to use your imagination. Imagine hanging this plumb line right in the middle, right in the middle of, our, of our gathering here this morning. And for those of you at home, imagine it hanging there before your screen this morning. And this plumb line is 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the love chapter. So let's hang it here this morning. And this is going to be a little bit painful because if you want to be obedient to God's word and you're ready to tear down, well, there's going to be a cost. And, you know, if there's ever been a time in church history that we've needed a plumb line, it's right now. It's right now. COVID is the greatest distraction the church has ever faced in a very, very long time. Um, we are standing in a very unique moment in church history. So let's be careful how we build. And yes, perhaps it is time to tear down and rebuild. Well, let's examine it. <clears throat> First Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 4. It tells us there that love suffers long and is kind. So love is patient. It does, not latch, it does not lash out or react in anger or upset. It's not opinionated, but it listens. And it does not pay evil with evil, giving people in our estimation what they deserve. But love gives what people do not deserve. Love gives what people do not deserve. What did the Lord Jesus give to us? We who were so undeserving, who were, were enemies to the Lord Jesus. He gave us grace, didn't he? He gave us grace, forgiveness, salvation from condemnation. He suffered long for us and paid the ultimate price for our sins on the cross of Calvary. And we are living the same life, are we living the same life of grace and forgiveness towards others like our Lord did towards us? It says here that love does not envy Love is not covetous. You know, social media can be a great tool for connecting to loved ones. It can be used for, as a tool for evangelism, encouraging others. But unfortunately, it is probably one of the most destructive things in our world today, comparing self to others. Um, it's a distraction that can easily take our eyes off of Christ and onto worldly attitudes. Um, worldly endeavors and worldly mindsets. See all the horrible things in the last few years that has come out of social media. We have just a small list of things, anxiety, depression, bullying, hatred, judgment, 
suicide, you know. Really, when you look at it, there's little on social media to give anybody much encouragement. And you know, a defective plumb line only builds disasters. And if you're using social media in any way as a plumb line, well, I strongly suggest that you pull out the book of Proverbs and keep it very close by while you're using your social media to avoid that crooked path. Love does not give room to selfishness and personal gain. Moving along, it says that love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up. True love is humble, isn't it? Um, it does not show off. It does not come across as knowing everything or trying to be the best at everything or having the best. As believers, we know our condition of sin, and it's only by God's grace that we have received our position and salvation in Christ. It is only in him and him alone in whom we should boast. We have nothing to boast of within ourselves. In verse 5, it says that love is not rude. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked, and it thinks no evil. Self-denial. Self-denial. How often do we think about that? How often is it preached off the platform? How often do we think of self-denial within our own lives? It's about putting others first and putting yourself last. And that completely exactly describes the life of the Lord Jesus that we read about in the Gospels, doesn't it? He had a total selfless servant attitude. Are we holy in our attitude and response to others? Love is self-controlled. It is not self-seeking. Love is wise to keep quiet in opinion in the midst of a world of meaningless noise and self-promotion. And we should be only speaking those things of Christ that are above this world, the things that are above this world. You know, COVID is not in heaven. We won't find COVID there, but that is where we are seated. That's what the book of Ephesians says, that we are seated in heaven, and that's where the God of love resides. Verse 6 says, Love does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth. You know, it feels good to have sin justified in your life. You have to admit that there are those times where, you know, it feels really good to have sin justified. We don't like having those feelings of guilt in our lives. You know, the seared conscience can bring a lot of false peace into our lives. You know, our sinful minds desperately seek out ways to make sin in our lives okay. Our comfort and self-righteousness is many times greater than the desire to repent and get right with the Lord. Being satisfied and joining with others of the same attitude, the same sin, instead of encouraging ourselves and others to turn to truth and to God's righteousness. But love looks to the plumb line of God's perfect righteousness and truth. Verse 7, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. How often are we trying to uh, avoid the challenges that come our way in life? I would say we try to do it very, very often. Or we try to find the quick way of uh, getting out of any type of adverse situation that comes our way. You know, God, he is the engineer. He is the logistics manager of our lives. And when we see God as the source in our lives of the challenges that we face, then we, by faith, we renew our minds through thinking that and to see his hand in everything that is going on in our lives. And we can be more positive. We can be more encouraged as we press through the trials that we face in this life. Jeremiah 29, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end, Romans chapter 8. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Aren't you thankful for these portions of scripture 
to help us get through the trials of life. These are very important portions of scripture. You know, God's purposes can differ in various circumstances, but in all things, God has one common goal. He has one common goal always in all things, in every trial that we face, and it is this, the desire for us to have a deeper relationship with him as a result of the experience. And as we see the love of God work in our hearts and in our lives more freely, we can be able to give love more freely to others in very difficult times. You know, God allowed COVID. He allowed it to happen, didn't he? So the question is, how are we dealing with it? How are we dealing with that? Are we patiently enduring it? Sometimes I really think we lack perspective. We've been through this for two years, but two years is a very short time. It's not very long. How are we enduring it? World War I was four years. World War II was six years, and that was bloody battle. That was horrible circumstances. Are we enduring these two years? We don't know how much longer it's going to go, but we're not facing world wars. We're not facing people out on the battlefield dying. Are we patiently enduring this? Verse eight, love never fails. Love never fails. A plumb line is the focal point. The plumb line is the point of reference. It is 100% reliable. It is faithfully trusted. It is something that can be relied upon. It is fact and it is true. And love is always the best choice. It's always the answer. Love. But the thing about love is, in making that choice, is that it's not always the easiest choice. When we come to the divergence in the road, when we need to put a situation on the balances and make a choice, how often do we ignore the Holy Spirit's leading and choose the right way? choose the Lord's way, the way of love, and be satisfied within ourselves to have peace in the fact that we made that right decision. And not only that, but be encouraged in having successfully overcome sin. How often does that happen in our lives? I know I look at my own life and I can say that you know, it doesn't happen as often as I should. Humbly having joy and having chosen the leading of the Holy Spirit and not the flesh. In conclusion, just want to raise this little situation regarding the Titanic. It says, when the Titanic was under construction, the design team had a five-hour planning meeting in which four hours and 50 minutes were spent discussing the interior decorations, and 10 minutes was given over to lifeboat safety design. And we look at what happened to the Titanic. It sank, and many people lost their lives that day. So brothers and sisters, let's not get distracted by the things in this world that in the end won't matter. They won't matter at all. Let's focus on what is most important. The Lord has set a plumb line in the midst of the world, and he set it in the midst of his church. Let's keep our focus on our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, especially during these very difficult times. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that you have set a plumb line in the midst of the world, in the midst of the church, in the midst of our lives. And Lord, we confess, we repent of the fact that we are not referring to the plumb line as much as we should. And Lord, we are just so thankful for the Lord Jesus, for his perfect example. We do have a plumb line. And we pray for the Holy Spirit to continue to work in our hearts and in our lives to help us not forget that we need to refer 
to the plumb line that you have established. We're so thankful, Lord, for salvation. May we take joy in that, and may we learn from the many things that we have discussed here this morning from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Love, love is so important. It should be a central point of our lives as believers, being reflections of the Lord Jesus Christ, being conformed into his image through love, through the love that you expressed and showed us. It should be outpouring from us every day, but Lord, we confess that we need you to come in, we need you to change our hearts. And so, Lord, we pray that you would uh, work in the hearts of each one of us. We pray, Lord, for this assembly, and we are, we're thankful for this assembly, the dedication and the preaching of God's word that goes faithfully out from here every Sunday, every Lord's Day, and in other various ministries through uh, programs and through individuals. Thank you for West Fifth. We commit it to you. And we pray, Lord, for the unity of this assembly. We pray for unity in the midst of a time where there is so much division. So we pray, Lord, that you would bind this assembly together in your love. So we just commit them to you. Thank you, Lord, for your love and grace. And uh, we just pray that today all the glory will be yours in Jesus' name. Amen.